What's up, bros? <clears throat> What's up? Dude. We're running short today. We don't have Mark and Saul with us. Where's Mark Particularly and Saul boots on, on the ground? <laughs> on like the, like the one day when we have a big corporate merger. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. going to need to go through EBITDA and the multiples. I mean, shit. I don't know any of that. This is Mark and Saul's time to shine, and he's not here with us today. <clears throat> exactly. But big news, obviously, Diamondback acquiring Endeavor. Huge move for uh, shale industry and for Midland. What's the uh, what's the initial take, guys? I mean, I was I wanted Mark for the official take because this is the CEO of Diamondbacks quote. This combination meets all the required criteria for a successful combination, including sound industrial logic with tangible synergies. Have to throw synergies. You gotta always. have synergies. Improved combination capital allocation and significant <clears throat> near and long-term financial accretion. <laughs> I mean, you've got synergies and accretion in one, basically, quote from the CEO. We've got synergies and we've got accretion. It what checks, do you think, all, guys? checks all the boxes. It does. You know what's funny is I just met uh, Travis Stice for the last or for the first time two weeks ago when I was there at their office. He didn't know that they invested in us, so I had to run him through what digital hog catters <laughs> and what what we do. Um, but great, great guy. Had a really good conversation with him. Um, you know, I, I'm excited about this acquisition. You know, because when Pioneer got acquired, there's very much a sentiment of from people in Midland that it's negative for Midland. You know, Pioneer did a ton. Yeah, for the city and for the area, and so it's a little bit sad, like a loss for people. Um, but this Endeavor deal, I think that this is huge for Midland. Um, you know, and I think that it's way better than a Chevron or Exxon coming in. Wait a minute, you're them, saying so. Exxon's not local, bro? <laughs> it's, it's the it's, original OG. <laughs> it's the original OG. Yeah. Um, so back to my point was that I think that. Uh, Diamondback acquiring endeavors huge for the city of Midland and will be a great long term move for the city as well. So personally, I'm excited about that. Well, uh, that's that's always been historically part of Autry's deal is he wanted to leave it to a Midland company, and so yeah. kind of not not surprising on on that front that uh, that he'd do that. Yeah. How many lawyers do we think right now at Exxon are like busy scouring the breakup provisions of the deal to find out if they get a, <laughs> another bite at the apple? Yeah. Do we get one? Yeah. Not get one. I mean, if you look at Permian barrels of Permian oil equivalent per day, um, this new combined entity will produce roughly eight hundred sixteen thousand barrels, which is which is in in comparison, Chevron's about eight hundred fifty seven thousand barrels. And the combined Exxon Pioneer entity is roughly 1.3 million barrels. So it's actually going to be a pretty damn big. I saw uh, someone tweet shop. that, and I can't verify this off my own numbers, but I saw someone tweet that the uh, Exxon Pioneer uh, acquisition plus the Diamondback Endeavor acquisition <clears throat> accounts for 50% of all Permian production. That'd be 2.1 million barrel. I bet it's is it BOE a day? Yeah, uh, right. BOE a day. Yeah, so sounds that's getting close. Yeah, sounds right, getting real close. Yeah. What's interesting in the news, and we'll have Mark unpack this when he's back, <clears throat> but they purchased it for under four million dollars per acre. And la uh, earlier, when we were talking about Oxy's purchase of Crown Rock and Exxon's po purchase of Pioneer, they're way north of four million an acre location. A location. Yeah, not, uh, not per acre. Not per acre. Uh, per net acre. All right. Yeah, location. You're right. Yeah. Net acre. Good, good point. Thank you. The, um, so, so here's kind of my take from the just big picture looking at it is I always thought that if you won an acquisition, you overpaid, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, but you the, love the, that, didn't you? The, the value of something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The uh, the value of something is clearly the normal distribution of everyone's opinions. If you're buying, you're over here on the high side. Right. What's interesting when you start looking through what happens, though, is the economics go to a horizontal on one section versus a two section. 
and I don't know if they've hit three uh, three mile laterals down in the Permian yet, like they've been doing in the Bakken. But just the magnitude of that and what it does to the the economics, you truly can overpay for something, if you will, if you're if you're stacking up concentrated acreage positions. And so when you look at that map and Zach Copland's got a really good map he put out on Twitter and maybe we'll get um get uh Jacob to pull that up and post it in here. Peter Soto Karens sent me a really good map that's out on Twitter too that we'll pull up. And you just look at the overlay and acreage <clears throat> positions. I mean, this is this is, you know, hand in glove. So yeah, yeah. there really might be something here to where Diamondback plus Endeavor equals three. Yeah. As opposed to, to one plus one. So Yeah. Um, Chuck, it's interesting. Have you ever heard of the winner's curse phenomenon in economic theory? Actually auction theory. But, sure. Um, it was actually addressed in nineteen seventy one by three Atlantic Richfield petroleum engineers who claimed the oil company suffered unexpectedly low returns year after year after acquiring oil lease um <laughs> through auction because whoever won it always overpaid for the asset and so um well, it's I, always like, find, I always found it funny how this literal economic theory and, and auction theory was originally applied to oil and gas petroleum engineers damn right yeah. damn right the um the 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 funny thing uh about that is we used to always say around the office you literally think more about that asset than any other person on the planet. And the line was always, how many people are there on the planet these days? Seven billion, <laughs> eight million, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Eight, you think more of it than eight billion people. So, no, but the uh, the market loves it. I mean, the, the bottom line today is uh, we're recording this, at, call it 145 on Monday, stock's up 10%. So... I mean, it looks like like Diamondback made a really good deal, and this this is a unique asset. I mean, I don't know if y'all know a lot of Autry Stevens stories, but they're great. I mean, late seventies, he founds the company, literally the cheapest person on the planet. Last time I talked with Autry was about ten or eleven years ago, maybe twelve years ago, and uh, he was sitting in a middle seat on a Southwest flight next to me. <laughs> and I was literally like, come really? on, Aud Audrey, you're worth a billion. He goes, hey, you see how much that business select ticket costs? <laughs> it's expensive. I was like, okay. You know, what's funny is, um, did y'all ever see the show uh, Black Gold? It was on Discovery yeah. Channel. Well, it was a reality TV show about roughnecks. Yeah. And the first season... It was Big Dog Drilling, which is Autry's drilling company. And it was like Longhorn. And there was like a third third one. And they were all in a competition. But I don't know if Autry just saw like the, the marketing potential of this or not. But they got rid of the other drilling companies and then just honed in on making it a reality show for Big Dog Drilling. And anyways, uh, I drilled right out next door to them. So um, I would run into the guys all the time at the corner stores where we're heading out to the rig. <clears throat> and get this one time they invited me to a pool party with the production crew uh, and they wanted wait. to get me on the sh they wanted to get me on the show which is funny because a pool party yeah and where is this this is out in midland do they have pools in midland dude we got tons of pools in right, midland. this is the middle of a desert yes you got <laughs> pools <laughs> and uh anyways they wanted to cast me for the show i always think about how much different my life would have turned out if i was uh if i was on Digital wall cars would have had a whole yeah. new meeting, wouldn't it? It's not yeah. like you would have been sitting around on a camera. <laughs> yeah. You know, Speaking of that. Bloviating Chuck, about whatever. Now Chuck's over here auditioning for Netflix shows. I, I did. Chuck? Here's, before we get there, <laughs> yeah. I have a question. As I'm okay. looking at you, Colin, I'm wondering, are you really an oil field guy? or are you Because you seem to be an <laughs> office guy. And are you, I'm, I'm are you talking, no, somebody called, called, <laughs> called you the other day a digital dude, right? Yeah, I had it. A digital let's dude. Just, just let, let's bring that tweet up. What was that tweet? Because I've had such a kick out of this shit. Because I I was wondering, am I, should I be offended for being a digital dude versus a finance bro? Well, we need, now we, need to, we need to let our listeners have I been know promoted? what's going on. All right. All right. Well, okay. this is what Spell happened. This is what happened. <laughs> was there's this lady, Sharon. 
from North Texas up in Dallas. It's All always right. running around with the FLIR camera and whatnot. And anyways, uh, she's just not a intellectually honest person or capable of objective thinking. And so we're kind of picking on her a little bit. And then uh, railroad Texas Railroad Commissioner candidate Bill Birch, who Bill knows me, I know him, uh, he, he kind of got defensive about something I said. I can't remember what it was. And... Um, Anyways, we started. When you called started, him an ass, or no, 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 no. <laughs> never kidding. said that. Yeah, never, yeah, that's yeah, what. Yeah, no, yeah. no. Bill, Chuck Bill's kidding. like, he said, should the oil and gas industry not be monitoring their methane and yada 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 yada? And I was like, is that what I said? Because it wasn't what I said. Yeah. And he is like, oh, I didn't read too deep into this. I don't have time to. And so yeah. everyone was like laughing. Like, how are you making comments without like actually thinking or reading about what you're what you're talking about? Anyways. Then he tells Sharon that he makes a comment that he's like, well, digital wildcatters are a bunch of digital guys. They don't work out in the field and doing this. And it came off as him talking shit. Bill said on LinkedIn yesterday that that's not what he meant, that we all misinterpreted him. I, it seemed like he was talking shit to Dude, me. this is hot off the press. Seemed wow. like he, yeah, it seemed like he was talking shit to me. And so, of course, you know, I had to, like, you don't talk shit to me on Twitter and not, not get it back. So we're going back and forth. If Bill... I actually believe Bill, so that's not what he. Do we yeah, have him on the show? I, don't, I, don't I believe. Like, yeah, I like, that's what, I like Bill. We'll get Bill on the show. Yeah. That's what. That's Let's what get I was. Bill on the show. Yeah, I was confused why Bill was coming at me because I was like, I know Bill. Bill's a friend of mine. Yeah. Like we've yeah. talked, and so this is an open invitation for Bill to come on the show. I'd love to interview Bill. Yeah, and I think you know, I think that he was misinterpreted. But anyways, yeah, I did get offended by the dig that I'm a digital guy and not a field guy, <laughs> which I'm not a field guy anymore. I don't work out in the field. You know, my hands are soft sitting here doing fucking podcasts <laughs> <laughs> you had to turn the the podcast machine on so that's yeah that's i did work. i had to turn the cameras on and the microphone Damn, dude, on, that's like... work dude <laughs> <laughs> so anyways that's the latest but that, you get no respect is the bottom line i get no respect because when i used to roughneck like people told me i didn't look like a roughneck you know i'm a pretty boy out there i didn't know how to use a pipe wrench and shit and then now here I am, and it's like, oh, you're not in the field. I'm like, damn. No matter what you do, I'm blowing anywhere, shade, man. This man. is my this is my sub story. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, you know, going back, let, let's let's cross back over to Twitter in this uh, Diamondback deal because there is some speculation that Diamondback is posturing a little bit, doing this and defensive maneuver uh, because One World Petroleum is on the scene now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've got uh, it we got to talk about this too. we got to talk about one this world is one of my favorite uh twitter things that's happening <laughs> dude lately. this thing's at over a million views this is crazy so you know we're at nape and nape has this uh there's this this booth right in the middle of a uh, showroom floor and i mean this is an expensive a fucking booth. big booth big man. booth awesome booth man like they actually crush it on this booth i had booth envy this company, yeah. One World Petroleum. I'll have Jacob pull up the uh the Were picture you their of booth, it. babe? I was <laughs> not the booth, babe. All right. So hundred thousand dollar booth. Digital Wildcatters booth, but keep going, keep going. Chuck Colin. is our booth, babe. <laughs> uh got this really nice Fiverr logo, booth babes, and then they're giving away this twenty thousand dollar watch. And so I start looking into <laughs> Which I was company. trying to figure out this why the why a watch of all things. But yeah. Hey, dude, oil guys. Do roughnecks so, wear Rolexes out on the <laughs> patch? Landman, dude. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. good after Landman. Because that'll, that, that, that'll rip your arm right <laughs> off, man. Best watch I ever lost. So I started diving into the company. You know, they got four employees. Uh, two of the guys come from residential real estate. One of the guys is a real petroleum engineer, and then they have an executive assistant. And anyways, I, I look, pull up the CEO's bio. You want me to read some of these? Because they're oh, yeah. Hell it's yeah. brilliant. It's funny. So- uh, CEO Alex Ottawell is his last name, and all of this is pulled verbatim. Once reigning over the dynamic realm of real estate investment, Alex focused on the flip and fix space from 2011 to 2022. He single handedly revolutionized the space with his niche. At his peak, he simultaneously managed 15 to 25 mobile home projects utilizing his own in house curated renovation teams. Such was his prowess that he earned the esteemed nickname, the King of Trailers. <laughs> King of Trailers? <laughs> Hold on, let me, let me, uh... okay. A seasoned maverick, a relentless innovator, and an influential leader, Alex Ottawell continues to break boundaries and redefine the possible. 
One thing is certain, his journey is just getting started and the world can expect many more incredible feats from this 32-year-old unstoppable I force. I bet they received 50,000 resumes. <laughs> well, they probably did get a shit ton of deals from my post. So I make this post and all I did was take stuff from their website and this post has got 700,000 views on that, but over a million from some of the retweets and my inbox is flooded with some of my oil friends trying to contact him to sell off their pdp deals <laughs> so one of the one of the single greatest moments in my career when i was at stevens because everybody knew the stevens family had money so they'd call us to try to get us to invest i get a i call and i always whenever i got a business plan and i read it i would call back and just even if it's to say no so i call back i go hey this is chuck yates at stevens uh, I wanted to follow up with the business plan you sent me. I swear to God, the guy covers the phone. He goes, hey, man, did we send Stevens the oil and gas deal or the internet deal? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was so glad my answer was no there. Yeah. So, yeah, um, NAEP, was, NAEP was fun. Lots of activity. <clears throat> you know what I want to get a shout out to? Harold Ham for just being a, like, chill ass dude so like he's just hanging out at the four seasons bar with everyone Nate Hell tells yeah, me dude. he goes up to the front grabs his badge like everyone else does waited and, in line yeah yeah <laughs> i think that's pretty cool like nape has got to be the only place where it brings in someone like harold ham and he just dude he's it, a, like i mean he's else. a man of the people i mean he that's mo most oil and gas except the big internationals you know yeah yeah well i mean it, it, the, the greatest thing about our industry the oil and gas business is at one point, everyone's been broke yeah. or publicly shamed and humiliated or Absolutely. you know what, whatever you want. Yeah, so you've been humbled. Nobody's at up, but you can walk. Mm -hmm. You can walk up to Harold Ham, broke, and just say, "Harold, what about this?" And he's going to help you out because yeah. every, everybody else has been there. Yeah, I always say, and I also think that's why Houston, Texas, has the greatest people on the planet because we've all been broke. I always yeah. say the CEO yeah. of the oil and gas company when times are good, hundred dollar oil. Flying around in the private plane with his best friend, who's the janitor of the oil and gas company. And then when times are crappy, the CEO is sleeping on the janitor's couch and they talk about how much fun it was when they were flying around <laughs> yeah. on the plane. Yeah, so, I just wish I knew you when you were rich. Oh, uh, dude, it was fun. <laughs> I'll be the it, janitor. <laughs> oh, it, it was baller. We had uh we had some uh we had some good stories at NAPE. So ranking <clears throat> NAPE kind of and I I went to Nape first time back in like ninety four, ninety five. So I've, oh, I, yeah, I've, I've been I didn't know you were that old. You could like, yeah, probably Dude, you play can a be that sixty five year old on, on, on Netflix. That, <laughs> that just hurts coming from y'all too. So everyone that's listening, Chuck is auditioning for this role. I won't say what show. I don't know if it's private or not. But Mo, have, Mo season two. Yeah, so Mo season two. Mo Amir, the Houston uh, comedian, yeah. is funny. And Mo, the first, first season Mo was season great. one's great. Yeah, yeah. first season was great but they want chuck to play a mid 60 year old dude and so his feelings are a little hurt yes although i did get i did get asked to audition so i will say that but uh so my they, they seen you on tmz so many times like oh shit we got a superstar here i actually i actually sent in uh the footage of me doing stand-up on stage with whitney cummings so that was <laughs> i did do that but to get back to to nape i kind of felt enthusiasm kind of like vibe you know are we back i'm gonna say you know peak natural gas beginning of shales like oh five oh six in there were the craziest kind of nape vibes i felt this was kind of like a five to a six so definitely better than 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 average but at the same time not just buzzing of well, we're back we're reset. taking over the world jake and i were talking about this because this year seemed a lot higher energy in the city especially than, those that one world energy yeah, yeah they the brought world, it yeah yeah that, that's that's just who brought it but i think a couple things happened over the last the the last couple years one each last year and the year before there were winter storms that kept people from getting down here Okay. And someone brought that up. I was like, oh, yeah, you're that's right. A, that's true. Yeah, yeah, because I was like, man, it just seems like there's more people in town and the energy's high. 
So that probably played into it. But Jake and I were talking a little bit about some of us should be concerned about the 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 weather in general. It's getting crazy. There's weather events. <laughs> Things climbing. Anyway, change. sorry. Keep going. <laughs> Leave it to Kirk to throw in some snarky remark there. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, but Jake and I were talking because the first, like, we didn't get to go to Nape in the 90s because we were only, like, five. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but like, peak, peak Nape was, like, shell, you know, 2000, right. like, 12, 13. And it's just probably never going to have that buzz to it again, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, that was just Well, let me ask you a days. question. So I think you got to reset. Since you're a digital bro now, mm -hmm. and you don't really have, you have no more Midland cred, you just are an office digital guy. <laughs> Let me ask you, has Nate's, Nate, not Nate, Nate's Nate? grass, sort of grassroots vibe gotten stronger? So all these like the meetup parties that were more grassroots versus the big parties that everyone knows are going to go to. I felt like there were more, there was a lot of, a lot of parties, but a lot more grassroots connections through like social media, through different connections. Yeah, I mean, Landman Life's- What do you Life's, think about that? Landman Life's party was great. And that wasn't a big blown out party. You know, that was just, us, yeah, it was just 100 people from Twitter. Yeah. And, you know, we went to- But, but a, a went lot of Tampa really after. connected people in a way that was more organic or through social than it was through- big name company acts throwing parties. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think part of that's just the times, right? I mean, it is people, the times. You know, we're kind of, if we got it, let's say we got to whack two or three years out just for COVID, you know, so it may be in starker contrast than it would have been kind of gradually had we done that all through COVID. But um, yeah, I think there was a lot of grassroots, but also I think there's a time and place like Opportunes Party was badass. Like you have, Baggett always throws a great party. You have bottle girls hanging from the, uh, what do they call them? Not streamers, but they're like doing the aerial. Stripper they're, poles? No, they're doing no. like, they're doing like aerial <laughs> yoga. Aerial <laughs> yoga, like hanging from the ceiling, yeah. pouring drinks. Like that's over the top. Cool, cool shit. So. Dude, which is interesting because a couple of my opportune guys didn't invite me. Ooh. I mean, I got invite during the circuitous way because I knew that was going to be a good party. But like, what's up? With you had that? to ask. I, you I had mean, to ask. I, I get had it. My assistant asked for me, <laughs> which is me. But no, yes. I've kind of, I've kind of, I've kind of noticed the parties I've gotten kicked off the the list of. V and E doesn't invite me anymore. Oh, I still Dang. got that one, but I mean, my uncle was a partner there too for thirty years. I don't know. I, mean, I, got I think you're more of a liability, probably, Chuck. You know. <laughs> Big what? liability because Kirkland was still wanting me there. Yeah. Come How's on Kirkland? in. Kirkland was a great party. They they had over three thousand people at their night party. Huge. That's crazy. They had the seven one three venue. Oh, I saw where, that. Where we'll have Empower coming up, and they're for, giving out cowboy hats. Yeah, for years they used to have Robert Earl Keen play it. Now the last few years they've had Ryan Bingham. That's Bingham, about, yeah, the Bingham. Yellowstone, yeah, guy. Yeah, he was really good. Well, what else happened in the world of energy? This, I mean, we got some, we got a big Permian deal. We had Nape, uh, people recovering. What's happening in the rest of the world? One last quick Nape story just Let's while we're go. here. So I don't know. Do y'all know John Linker? No. John Linker was longtime first reserve oil and gas investor. And John could take a complicated, messed up situation and make it a sentence. You know, he was just that guy. He could summarize uh, and back there in kind of 05, 06, 07, peak crazy nape, uh, he was walking out. I was walking in and I go, John, what's going on in there, man? He goes, it's so great. Even the bankrupt companies have two booths. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, there you go. Well, I've got some uh, a, a couple across the pond stories that are All interesting. Right. One is, this is great. And we do have uh, Taiwan to talk about. We do in have the Taiwan. election stuff, so we'll close with that. This is interesting. So Fran France has Total Energy, huge yeah. energy company. Their long-serving CEO says warns government because there, that there's a risk of mis-selling the energy transition. States must acknowledge the shift to less polluting system will lead to higher energy costs. Mm. So this is a guy, this is a company that's been pushing the boundaries of 
energy transition. And now they're going public with warning of the CEO is that by pushing the energy transition is just going to increase energy costs. And everyone needs to understand that. But why if renewables are so much cheaper than fossil fuels? That's what I always, I mean, that's what everyone's preaching on Twitter <coughs> and in the world that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. If that's true, then why do energy prices go up in an energy transition? Absolutely. Why are people, you know, the other day we were talking about LNG and uh, we we're talking about LNG use in Africa and some guy was like, well, why would we get them on LNG when we have cheaper renewables? I'm like, hey, cheap, if there's cheaper renewables, why, why does that? prevent them from using renewables so they'll choose renewables over lng and like no one can ever answer that question of if renewables are cheaper then well, why why does why does lng stop renewables from being adopted why do you see electricity mm -hmm. prices in places like germany go up with increased uh renewable energy even in texas it's happened well and I overlay mean, that with companies that are supposedly mm -hmm. really greedy right and just care about money you know, we hear that all the time. The yeah. greedy energy greedy company. Yeah. Why bastards. aren't they choosing the the lowest cost? <laughs> that's yeah. a that's a I mean, oil and gas companies are capitalists. If it were if it were cheaper, China would be doing nothing but renewables. Mm -hmm. That there is a dictatorship that's very smart, very sophisticated, uses a lot of energy, understands a lot of energy. And the fact that they're just plowing the world full of coal plants yeah. to this Which they site. are building lots of renewable energy, but the, to well, they're point, owning like the that's... supply chain too. I mean, that's yeah. the point. Yeah. Here, here's a question. Here's a trivia question for you. Do you remember the name of Denmark's state oil company? No. It was called Dong Energy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. They rebranded. They were in. They rebranded. They were in, I remember meeting one of the executives of Dong Energy, and, and which he told me, "I'm with Dong Energy." Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, Dong Energy, Denmark state oil company. Um, they rebranded, and 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 Denmark being you know enlightened, they're like, "We're going away from oil and gas." So they became a wind company. They're now called Orsted. Okay. So Orsted, one of the leaders of renewables, um, they just uh, announced that they're uh, cutting costs. They're, they're firing 600, 800 people. They're pausing their dividend payments. Um, they're selling assets and refocusing their business priorities because they've been getting killed in the wind business. They've been getting killed on offshore offshore wind. absolutely so when subsidies when, when you when when government stops subsidizing renewables so this is a, this was actually a real well-run oil and gas company they just got woke and figured out that hey let's go to renewables and be first but they're paying the price so they're actually it, in pretty they're <clears throat> they're having a hard time i wonder who or said sells off assets to just because i mean you're the big dog <clears throat> in offshore wind doesn't seem like there's very much liquidity there compared to like an oil and gas company where you can spin off and you got a thousand different companies to sell something to. I wonder who's what your, the- Who's your balance sheet repair yeah, <laughs> vehicle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if I mean, they're will. exiting markets and offshore markets, Norway, Spain, Portugal, deprioritizing Japan, and planning for leaner development costs, including floating offshore wind projects. So they're trying to figure out ways to make money, which is interesting. So. You're hearing Total, you're hearing Siemens, you're hearing Orsted now saying like, whoa, whoa, hold the brakes because, you know, the subsidies aren't coming through. Yeah. Supply chain costs are getting more expensive. Um, it's interesting to see how the, the tide's turning. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting because if you go back to the, the thought that renewable energy is the cheapest source of energy that always doesn't doesn't seem to align with making money either right yeah. and so i actually posted something the other day i don't know if y'all saw this but uh i think it was the lieutenant governor of texas had posted that texas was going to build natural gas plants did y'all see this yeah dan um, patrick came out and said something to the effect of 
energy companies can build baseload natural gas or we're going to do it. Yeah. And so I tweeted out, I had this tweet that popped off. Hold on. I'm looking for it right now. Oh, I use, have y'all seen this meme where it's like Norman Rockwell painting of the guy standing up right. saying something. I said, if Texas is going to central plan and subsidize energy, it should be nuclear. <coughs> and that tweet ended up taking off and doing well, because I do think that there is a case that, you know, the, the, if you were to invest, if the state was to invest in energy and secure, reliable, and affordable energy, the GDP would would grow, right? And um, so it's like, hey, if nuclear doesn't make sense on an economic basis for private companies to do it, it could make sense for governments for to do it. Governments to do it. Yeah, and I think that the same could be said for you know renewables as well. But I always think about <clears throat> this when people are like renewables are the cheapest source of electricity it's like it's great but how do you make money as a <laughs> as a company doing that and i think i think going back to that remark the other thing to think about too which we've talked about on the show a million times so this is beating a dead horse but you can't just look at the price of an electron on the asset level you have to think about battery storage backup generation transmission you know there's a lot of costs that go into well, that from end to end well yeah i mean you basically have to start off with um because i i i actually back in the day was for the energy only market an energy only market being electricity is produced thrown on the grid you get paid for it right well then all the federal subsidies came in for for renewables so in effect they would get built for free mm -hmm. through tax credits and the like and then boom They'd make money whenever they put electricity on the grid. And it's just gotten us to the point where we've teetered on the brink, like Winter Storm Uri and various other ev uh, summer events we have when it gets too hot. I think you're going to have to do something to tweak the market for a capacity payment of some sort, meaning, okay, wind and solar, if you don't deliver, you pay a penalty. Yeah. Because yeah. to your point, some somebody's got to finance the backup. Well, the grid has to take it when they're generating anyway. By the way, when there's excess, so that's why prices in West Texas sometimes go negative. So there is grid. The grid not only are there times when they're not producing when Texas needs it, like especially when it's cold AF and the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, but also when there's excess, the grid still has to take that electricity, which is an issue. Yeah. They have yeah. to send it somewhere. I think it's funny because, you know, when we started the Empower Bitcoin Mining Conference a couple of years ago, like you'd hear these people that mm -hmm. were mining Bitcoin off of stranded renewable assets. And I was like, if you actually take time to think about that, like a stranded it's renewable asset. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why is there even such thing as a why stranded renewable asset? <laughs> yeah. Like you have stranded gas because gas is, you know, associated with oil production. And so you're producing oil and you don't have takeaway capacity for the gas. That makes sense. But a stranded wind farm, it's like, how, how was it economic for someone to build that and not have transmission or takeaway capacity? It's because- it was subsidized. They got paid for subsidized just, just for building it. And so one of our great oil tycoons did build a bunch of renewable assets in Texas T -Boone? because T Boone. Yeah. I mean, T Boone was big uh, ranch with a lot of uh, spots lot of wind. for wind turbines. Here's here. So here's, here's a funny question. It's a story that just came out. Uh, and this is going to hit, hit home to digital wildcatters. A bunch of yoga instructors are. <laughs> really upset with Lululemon because their supply chain is, as they grow, their supply chain is increasing their emissions. And yeah. so they're really, people are quitting and like, I'm lost because Lululemon <laughs> is not who I thought what they stood for because they are, their corporate pillars are be human, be well, be planet. Be planet. If they're not 100% renewable, people are quitting and, and pushing back. So their customers, their ambassadors are pushing back on the company because their supply chain emissions are growing as the company grows. Well, you know, there's this, the problem what with, yeah. The problem with these brands, and I see like clothing brands that are trying to be started <laughs> that are sustainable clothing brands. And I'm like, there's nothing you, just by the very definition, you can't manufacture something in China 
and ship it over on a boat to the United States and think that you don't have <laughs> emissions <laughs> emissions and a carbon footprint, right? And so um, they're okay. going to have to buy offsets, which is which most um, consumers don't understand what that means. It means they're not really eliminating greenhouse gases. What they're doing is they're buying some wind farm that has excess, stranded excess yeah. capacity and yeah. saying, hey, somewhere in Iowa, the wind's blowing really hard. It's excess. Well, I saw some. I'm going to buy credits against that. I saw and some still headline. still ship via barge. I Diesel. saw some headline that the Super Bowl, hold on. Let me let me find this. Let me Google this real quick. Um, but the headline was, this Super Bowl is the first Super Bowl ever powered 100% by solar energy. And... At night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You already knew where I was going with this. But uh, yeah, Super Bowl 58 to be the first fully powered by renewable energy. And so I thought that was funny because, yeah, in the in the evening at nighttime. And so what does that actually mean? And, you know, I I hate. They bought offsets. And not only did they buy offsets, they bought cheap offsets because they're voluntary and they're not permitted so going back to something you were talking about chuck with um the, a carbon tax or or capacity you know the capacity markets where you're penalized if you don't participate etc um it's interesting a lot of funny math out there yeah, yeah i think that there's so much grift that can't even so be much grift. uncovered like my mom used markets. to say if it's bad don't do it <laughs> period you know well the who was it there was sometime last year there was a story of some company had like hundreds of millions of dollars of junk offsets sitting on their balance sheet that they had bought. And it turned out like they weren't actually, you know, good offsets that had been verified. And so all of a sudden they just had all of these offsets that they bought and weren't even, weren't even viable. And so companies like that, how are you even supposed to know if what you're buying is quality offsets in the in the first place yeah, i mean so. there will be standardization there and so <clears throat> they say, the vast but... majority will get at some point to where they're what people are agreeing to we can all then sit on the sidelines and go well that's just total bullshit because you kind of made up the fact that your plant was going to do a hundred million tons of this and you decided to do less the world's a better place Nah. Eh. Well, I don't know. oh, because you, COVID you know, hit and our manufacturing plant didn't run for, for exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's going to be gaming of that system. Like I was at some V today, and I was listening to someone talk, and they're talking about emoji? how, yeah, with emoji, emoji's a good friend of mine, and anyway, someone was talking about he started some Vita in my building. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, my sister, some Vita is a fucking awesome. Uh, He's smart, awesome, dude. dude. They're so smart. Great friend of mine too. Um, but someone was talking about, and they just made a comment about putting a price on carbon. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately because, you know, there's a subset of people out there that want a carbon tax and they want to put a price on carbon and tax oil and gas companies. I don't know if y'all saw this video from Elon Musk about a week or two ago, but he had this really long video talking about how there needs to be a carbon tax. And, um, anyways, I always think about... Okay, if we're gonna tax carbon and I, I kind of call it a phantom, phantom accounting, and it's these you know <clears throat> externalities that yeah you can measure, but it's it's a little bit of a gray area. Then you think about okay, well shouldn't there be a price on reliable baseload energy as well? And kind of your point that you made earlier, Chuck, of hey if you say that you have this much capacity and you do not deliver that, then you need to pay for it. Because yeah. there should also be a tax and a penalty on yeah. not having um, reliable and consistent energy. And so that's like, we can talk about a carbon tax and all these things, but let's also <laughs> tax the other inefficiencies in the system. That's a good point. So I don't think that, you know, it can just be one and not the other. I think you have to have a fair playing field. Probably so. Probably so. Yeah. All right. Close with Taiwan. Yeah. Back to our go. recurring series on this is the year of the election. Two billion people are going to vote. Seven out of the 10 largest democracies in the world are voting. Geopolitically strategic folks are voting. And we had one of those in January with Taiwan. 
So just real quick to level set on Taiwan for everyone, you got a multi-party democracy. You do direct elections of the president and the vice president. Legislature has a single body, 113 members. So on January 13th, I haven't checked to see if that was a Friday or not, but uh, on January 13th, uh, Lai Chin T, who won an unprecedented third straight term as president, he's with the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP. He got 40% of the vote. Uh, the opposition party KMT got about 33%. Their candidate did. And then the Taiwan's people party TPP, their candidate got 26% of the vote. What was interesting though, is the KMT party got 52 seats in the legislature. DPP has 51 seats. The TPP have eight seats. I don't know who the other, uh, two seats are. Very much divided government, uh, obviously very str- strategic, right? Semiconductor industry, 50% of the world's container ships pass through the Taiwan Straits. And kind of where this impacts us and the reason to talk about it for just a second is the DPP are the most anti-Chinese of the parties. So China has not come out and publicly bashed the elections, but they have frowned upon people like the United States, France, saying congratulations on the the election. So this kind of sets up the the tension, if you will, because if you think about it, they're the kid and the United States and China are mom and dad going through a divorce, if you will. And Taiwan's kind of sitting there in the middle. There are there are electronic components that we absolutely only buy and can only buy from Taiwan. So it is a very strategic island for the United States. And if China cut it off, we'd be in, we'd be screwed. So it's, it's a big issue. Uh, you know, That's chi- why. China goes through a, uh, a weaker economy. Is that maybe a flex, something they want to push? What happens if Trump gets back elected versus the way Biden's played it? I mean, we could dig all day into Biden versus Trump on China. And t- to Biden's credit, you could make a case that Biden's actually been tougher on China with some of the uh, embargoes he's put in place. I mean, Trump was certainly louder about bashing China, particularly in public. So, you know, that kind of the ghosts of Hong Kong sitting there. This is this is kind of one to watch because it's a bit of a powder keg there. Yeah, I don't have much to add to it because I don't know much about it. But, yeah. Um, while we're talking about foreign policy and affairs, did y'all watch the Putin and Tucker I Carlson did. I did. interview? I watched a little bit of it. I haven't watched the whole thing yet. I'm like an hour in, so I just got past the history lesson. <laughs> at the, <laughs> at the beginning. Which is actually quite... Phenomenal. It was actually really fucking good. Everyone's bashing him for it, but he gave it off the top of his head. Dude, too. That's what I was like. It's actually terrifying to watch Putin talk and then watch Biden talk. I mean, and that's like different. he cares about his he cares about his history. Yeah, he does for sure. And so, anyways, I found it pretty fascinating. But um, yeah, I'm about halfway through it. So <clears throat> took me two. I fell asleep halfway <laughs> through the first time and second time I made it through, but. Um, it's interesting to one, I, I love that Tucker did that. Did y'all see the AOC video where, when he got deplatformed from Fox news, AOC made this video celebrating it. And she's like, it couldn't have happened to a better guy. Deplatforming works. His career is dead. Yada, 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 yada. And then Tucker, which I'm not a huge fan of Tucker, but rises from the ashes. I mean, he's got launches. more followers and Dude, he's than, fucking than, crushing I mean, he's it. Trumped. Man. Yeah. Trump, no pun intended, Fox <laughs> News. I mean, yeah. he's, he's gone crushing it. And so I love to see him and Elon getting some views and wins over on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, they're talking talking a, a hundred million, two hundred million type views on this thing. Where yeah. on a good night on Fox News, he got four million. Yeah, views. You know, exactly. I, I'm going to make a request. Yep. Moving forward, maybe every week, but we're going to give an update on One World Petroleum. Yeah. <laughs> 
because I just extended an invitation. The CEO, me. hey, if he's listening, Alex, I want to talk to him. Alex, I, I pinged you on Instagram to Alex, come on the podcast. Alex, <laughs> this is it. he. He says it's bold. He knows he didn't start. He's never had any oil and gas experience. But one of his hashtags is marketing ninja. Ooh. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, Con- hat, content, hat, no is cattle the gr- or. I want to, let's let's update. If he's successful, we're going to applaud, right? Like, yeah, that was the yeah. biggest, boldest move anyone has ever made. But if you crash is, and burns, you know, we're going to say, let's just be wow. clear, you know, I don't think that he's fraudulent or anything like that. I just think that he's going to get his ass handed to him in oil and gas. Like, it's much harder than either, mobile homes. So. Either, either that or he buys at the right time, winds up at $150 oil and talks about what a shrewd investment it all <laughs> is. So uh, God bless him. Yeah, on. commodity prices can either make you the the, the hero or the, the zero. You gotta love just just one out. last thing to, to close on Taiwan with is sitting there watching, it's really important. You were talking all those components that are essential we need for life. Also, it goes without saying, but let's say it anyway, for the energy transition to happen, it doesn't happen without Taiwan. This is true. You know, I mean, those, those, those critical component type pieces are coming through there. So absolutely. Speaking of, there's a great TV show on Netflix about the Taiwan, uh, mafia. I think it's called, forget the name of it. Um, I'll, I'll bring it up next week, but it's hilarious. They, they, one of the brothers has never been raised in the mafia. He doesn't know he's part of it. Mom <laughs> escapes Taiwan to raise him in L.A. Um, and then, then, then things shit happens. But the older brother is the assassin and sort of the man in line to be the next mafia boss of one of the big family crime families. And then his little brother is kind of a loser. I mean, he's smart, but he's like knows nothing about how to fight. Has no, he's too nice, and it's hilarious to see. It's a funny, funny show. I thought you were, I thought this was like a real documentary, but it sounds like it's uh, it's in I, it. thought, I thought we were going back to Mo's season one because it's not that, it's not that far Chuck's, off. Chuck's gonna go audition. For if anyone see it, we're well. gonna get some Twitter action on that, but I'll All right. it. Well, good show. We'll be back next week. Is Mark and Saul with us next week? So Mark is back with us, but you're gone. Oh, I'm is gone. That right? Yeah, I'm yeah. in Fort Worth next week. So Dude, your boy's gonna there? have to anything to promote. Um, marketing ninja yeah you know i'm just doing it's marketing all, ninja stuff all about uh, clyde pro baby yeah i hear it's flying man it is man yeah. it's taken off so it's been it's been fun congratulations by yeah. the way we'll start working with nape soon it sounds like i'm actually meeting with nape in fort worth so yeah I'll get to talk yeah. to that team up there so all right we will be back next week appreciate everyone tuning into the show see y'all later